Hello, my name is Terry Zwollen, and I'm director of the Cochlear Implant Program at the University of Michigan. I'm very pleased to speak with you today about the basics of sound processor programming as part of the ASHA Professional Development Series. My disclosures are listed on this slide and include that I'm the professor and director of our implant program. I'm on the advisory board for Cochlear Americas and Envoy Medical. I'm a consultant for MemSTEM as well as the Institute for Cochlear Implant Training, and I have received financial compensation from ASHA for this presentation. I've also served as an advisor for the ASHA Audiology Conference Series for 2019. So let's begin with just an overview of what is sound processor programming. Well, we all know it's well documented that children and adults who receive cochlear implants are often able to receive open set speech recognition. They're doing great with these devices. But this is only possible when the levers delivered to the auditory system are set appropriately by the implant audiologist. Quality sound processor programming is essential for success. Its value is often underestimated and the complexity of it is also often underestimated. It's a very important appointment for both adults and children in order to optimize their hearing. Preparing for post-operative programming really begins in the preoperative stage. So one of the first things that the surgeon does is order a CT or an MRI so we can look at the status of the cochlea. If cochlear abnormalities are noted on the CT or MRI, then the implant audiologist is going to have different expectations about the sound processor programming than if the CT and MRI show normal cochlear function. If the child has cognitive delays or behavioral issues, those are also going to impact the planning of the programming session that we'll be doing. The CT and MRI, if they show cochlear abnormalities, we might expect higher than um, normal levels for the child or for the adult. Whereas cognition or behavior, they won't absolutely affect the levels of stimulation, but we might have to plan differently for the programming sessions. We might need a test assistant in the appointment. We might need to speak with the parent about the behavior. But importantly, for all of these things, they're going to set our expectations for how we'll program the device, as well as expectations for the type of outcome that child or that adult will have with his or her device. And really in the preoperative stage, it's very important for us to be setting postoperative expectations for performance because all of the time throughout that postoperative process, we're going to be checking to see if that child or adult is meeting our expectations for performance. Some of the scans that help verify device placement are just as important as those preoperative scans, and these scans can be taken in the operating room at time of surgery. So the array can be um, replaced prior to closing of the incision if the initial placement is not optimal. So in the top right-hand corner here, we have uh, an, an, a picture of an x-ray that was taken actually post implant but you can see here how we can look at the placement of the electrode array and that that looks like a great placement down here we have an example of one that was taken in the operating room at the time of surgery and that's in the bottom right hand corner those are a little bit harder uh, for clinicians to see than than what we can see here but it's good enough for us to tell that it's proper placement of the electrode array. If the surgeon takes this intraoperative x-ray and notes that it's not good placement, they can replace the device prior to closing of the incision. If we obtain one like this prior to activating the device and we see a problem with the placement, we can help manage our programming along with any of those issues. So it will really alert us to any potential problems we might see. 
Here we've got uh, an example of a more high-tech 3D CT scan, which uh, several clinics actually are using these days. Some clinics are using them in the operating room and other clinics are using them post-operatively. And this is actually an, a CT scan, a 3D CT scan of one of our patients. And we were alerted to the fact that you can see right here that there was a foldover in the electrode array. So these CT scans give us important information about placement of the array within the scala tympani, but they can also provide us with information about potential problems we might see. This particular patient, uh, we ended up explanting his device and re-implanting it with a different device. In that case, we then took an interoperative x-ray, verified electrode placement, and this patient is doing very well. There are more things that we need to do prior to mapping to prepare our patients for mapping. So prior to surgery, we want to discuss the entire process with our parents so that they know what to expect after surgery. One of the things that implant clinicians can do is work with their speech language pathologist to establish a conditioned response, either to sound or to touch. If we have a, a preoperative child who's unable to hear anything at all with hearing aids, it's very hard to condition him or her to sound. But we can condition them to respond to touch, and they're just learning the conditioning response. So oftentimes, our speech pathologist preoperatively will work with the child, work with the family to help us obtain that conditioned response because we're going to use that in the programming session with the child. And if they've already established that, our programming is going to go much better. We want to make sure that we discuss behavior modification techniques with the parents, uh, especially if we expect a difficult time getting the child to attend to tasks. So things that we might talk with the parents uh, about prior to surgery might be, is it okay with you if we place the child in a high chair? In some of the preoperative appointments, we might get used to having the child sit in the high chair and attend. Is it okay with the family if we're going to use food as a type of motivator or reward during the appointment? Or if the clinician doesn't like having food in the appointment, then the parent needs to know not to bring the types of snacks that the, the child might, uh, might want to have. We also need to discuss the number of family members who will attend the activation. Um, some are well-intentioned, but everyone wants to, to be there for when the child first hears. But if your office is small and can't accommodate six family members, it's important to discuss that so that they're not all sitting in your waiting room uh, when you come out to get the patient for their activation. And importantly, we want to discuss with parents how to discipline poor behavior. Many of the patients who come to our clinic travel two, sometimes three hours to get here. And if the child has a meltdown and the parents uh, and I or the parents and the clinician don't agree on how to discipline poor behavior, that family might leave without having gotten anything accomplished during that appointment. So we really want to work closely with the families to ensure that we, we are able to get the most that we can can out of that child during that appointment. So this slide just provides an overview of some of the things we're going to be talking um, during this session where we look at what is the purpose of a mapping appointment. And I think you'll see there's a, a, a lot more listed here than you would think other than just programming the processor. So the first thing we want to do is check the general health of the incision area and the scalp beneath the magnet. We need to check the status of the internal device as well as the external equipment. We want to look at the child or the adult's device use. We want to optimize and update their hearing. We want to provide updates since the last appointment. Patients always need to know about upgrades to the external sound processor, possible software developments, and really it provides us with an opportunity to answer questions that any of the family members might have. We're going to review how we evaluate performance. And really, overall, we just want to determine if the patient is receiving the most that they possibly can from using their cochlear implant. So let's begin with the activation day. We've already talked about how we prepare for this big, stressful day. 
I, this typically occurs about two to six weeks after surgery. In our clinic for years, we did uh, four weeks after surgery and we recently switched to two weeks and we were able to do that because the devices that we're now implanting are, are smaller. They require smaller incisions, so the healing is much faster and we, we really feel that uh, most patients are adequately ready uh, about two weeks after surgery. The activation day varies from clinic to clinic, but it typically will last about one to two hours for that appointment. And I think the most important thing to remember about the activation day is the goal is to provide auditory sensation and have the child return willingly and cooperate for future appointments. I think one mistake that clinicians often make is they're trying to optimize the map and send the child home with um, hearing that the parent can notice and they can say, wow, my child's hearing. But we don't really focus on that in our clinic. We really look at this as the starting point of providing auditory sensation, making it pleasant, helping the family adjust to getting the device on the child. If we set it too loud, they are going to pull it off right away. If we set it just right or even softer than normal, they're probably going to adhere to wearing the device. They're not going to um, not want to wear the device. So it seems to all go well. And we warn families that probably it's going to be quite soft for them after that first day. But we have plenty of appointments after that where we can turn it up and optimize the sound that the child or the adult is receiving after that. One of the first things we're going to do is check the incision. I've got some pictures here uh, up on the top right. We can see sort of a, a, a typical incision area and what that will look like approximately two to four weeks after surgery. We need to determine what strength magnet is needed because all of the external processors are held in place by an externally worn magnet. We want to make sure that that magnet strength is adequate and that it's not too tight or too loose and we have to check this at the activation but as well at all of the subsequent appointments because use of a magnet that is too strong can lead to breakdown of the skin. In this bottom picture here we can see the area so we'll have the patient lift the coil up and look at the area of skin that lies directly beneath the magnet. If a patient came into the clinic and I saw this red spot on their scalp, I'd start to worry. I, this is an indication that their skin is starting to break down. So I would either ask them to take the device off for a couple of days or I would reduce the strength of the magnet in that area. Skin break drop, breakdown is particularly problematic in very young children and the elderly because they tend to have thinner skin uh, than sort of middle-aged patients will. Also, if someone loses weight, let's say they haven't been seen in your clinic for a year and they've lost 30 pounds and they're using a number three magnet, boy, if they lose 30 pounds, they're probably gonna reduce it down to a number two or a number one. So we always have to communicate with our patients if anything has gone on in between appointments that might affect the strength of the magnet that's being used. You might be looking at this picture in the middle and saying, what the heck is that? Um, that's actually a, a magnet board that we have in our clinic and that's how we store our magnets. We have the magnets for all three different manufacturers. We list them so we can go grab a magnet quickly that's of different strengths. So along here, we have numbers at the top that are telling us what numbers. But I really just put this up because it shows us all of the different choices that are out there for magnets. And I really can't emphasize enough how important it is for the clinician to be monitoring the incision area, especially that area of skin that lies directly beneath that magnet. Next thing we do is we listen to the sound processor microphone. And if I had to list one area that's often overlooked in a mapping appointment, I would say this is probably it. It sounds like such a simple step. Um, the way that we keep it 
in our our program and we remember to do it is we've added a reminder in our template uh, regarding the sound quality of the sound processor microphone even though poor microphone quality is rare uh, patients won't necessarily notice if the microphone quality becomes poor over time typically happens gradually and their program will become softer and softer but they just turn the volume up but um, a muffled microphone is going to affect the sound quality overall for adults if we're up to seeing them just once a year this might be the only time their microphone is checked all year for parents if they see us listening to their child's microphone it will reinforce the importance of good sound quality and it will show them how important it is for them to check the microphone quality of their child's device so someone with normal hearing has to be the one to use the microphone that lets us listen to the sound processor microphone Again, this provides a good opportunity for us to discuss maintenance of the microphone protectors, to discuss use of the dry and store, which I have a picture of that right here. So the dry and store is where the patient will place their processor at night when they're sleeping. It will take out any moisture that has built up in the processor and any moisture that might potentially affect or degrade the microphone sensitivity. So these are sort of basic troubleshooting skills that we need to talk to uh, with our patients about prior to every single appointment. This just shows some of the microphone filters and how we change them. And then I, I really like this slide here because it shows all of the microphone options that we have available for the various processors. And we need to be aware that sometimes we have to change the filters on all of the microphones that are in use. So now we finally get down to the programming where we're actually connecting the sound processor to the computer. All of the devices have user-friendly interfaces. They used to be these huge boxes, but now they're these small components that uh, connect via USB to our computer. And we then can connect the sound processor to the computer so that we can make changes to the sound processor program. These show the ones for Cochlear, for Advanced Bionics, and for Medel, they all seem somewhat similar. And we also have some wireless ones that utilize Bluetooth for connections. And um, it's a, a great advancement because sometimes the children get a little freaked out about the wires and being able to walk around the room or sit freely without being attached to a wire is important for some children and really facilitates better behavior in the appointment. One of the first things that the software will take the clinician to uh, as soon as they've plugged in the processor to the clinician's computer is referred to as impedance telemetry. And on the far right, I have just some samples of what impedance telemetry looks like for the clinician for the cochlear, uh, the Medel, and the advanced bionics software in that order. Impedance telemetry is a measure of the resistance to current flow that surrounds the various electrodes. So what you can see here is a measurement of all the different electrodes. And then this is the current flow or impedance uh, level for each of those electrodes. Here in the Medel device, it's indicated for each of the electrodes. And then here's the level and advanced bionics places them out in a graphic level, which is good because we can see changes that occur over time in impedance. The most beneficial thing about impedance telemetry is that it identifies potential problems with the electrodes in the array, such as if there's a short or an open circuit. So we have to remember that this is an electronic device and sometimes with electronic devices, things might fail. It might be one electrode, it might be the entire array, but this way we can evaluate each single electrode to make certain that it's functioning properly and within specifications that the manufacturers have set for it. The next thing we're going to do after we plug in, we'll run those impedances. Then we will typically check for data logging. Data logging is a fabulous uh, introduction that came about in the last couple of years. And prior to this, we would sit down, we would ask a parent or we would ask a patient, how often are you wearing your device? 
and they would tell us, I'm wearing it all day, or, well, I'm wearing it most of the day. But data logging means that there's a computer chip in the patient's sound processor that will keep track of how often that device is connected to the internal device. So it will provide us with information about device use, so how many hours a day, on average, since their last appointment, are they using their device, the different types of scenes that they're exposed to. So for example, here we can see that they're exposed to speech, and this is how often they're exposed in quiet. This one represents speech and noise. So there's different areas that we can tell uh, what kind of exposure or what kind of scenes they're exposed to. It's also helpful because I might say to the patient, well, which program do you use most often? And we can give them up to five different programs. And someone might look at me and say, I have no idea. I just put it on. But the data logging can provide me with information about which program they're using most often. So in this example, this patient's using number one, number two, but most of the time is using number three. And if these are different measurements associated with these programs, I will then start with program three because I know that that's the one that they've been using most often. I can also look at the volume and the sensitivity settings they're using. If the patient's wearing their device at a, a volume of 10 of 10, I think I probably want to turn that program down a little bit. If they're wearing it all the way, I'm sorry, if they're wearing it 10 and 10, I probably want to turn it up a little bit. If they're wearing it down at a volume setting of one or turned all the way down, uh, then I'm going to want to turn it down because that's telling me uh, it's a little bit too loud. So this provides me with important objective information that will help guide my programming session. Data logging is a great tool and it's currently available with all three of the available devices. So before we start looking at the nuts and bolts of sound processor programming, I thought it would be good to um, begin with just a, a description of some of the basic parameters of sound delivery. As we all know, frequency information is important for speech understanding, and in a cochlear implant, we can convey frequency or pitch information to the implant user in two primary ways. It can be conveyed by rate or place of stimulation. So if we think about a multi-channel electrode array, so for example, we either have 12 or 16 or 22 electrodes throughout the cochlea, we know that if we stimulate an electrode at the base of the cochlea, the patient's going to hear something that's high-pitched because our basal area of our cochlea responds to high pitches. If we stimulate an electrode at the apical end or the top of the cochlea, they're going to hear a sound that sounds more lower pitched. So based on that place of stimulation, we can help convey this important parameter of frequency or pitch. Similarly, if we stimulate an electrode, let's say we take electrode in the middle of the array, um, number eight, and we stimulate it at a very fast rate, the patient's going to tell us that they're hearing something that's high-pitched. If we slow down that rate and stimulate it at a slow rate, they're going to hear something that sounds lower pitched. So the implant manufacturers have put together these great strategies that utilize both that place of stimulation and the rate of stimulation to provide our implant recipients with important information required for speech recognition. Uh, and they convey that information of frequency or pitch through, it, through those two modes of stimulation. Another important cue for speech recognition is amplitude or loudness. And the way that we code loudness in a cochlear implant is we know we're delivering a, a current level, a very small current level, to each of those electrodes. If we deliver a lot of current, then that stimulus is going to sound loud. And if we turn down that current level, then they're going to perceive it as softer. So this is going to be how we're going to convey amplitude or loudness cues to the implant patient. The third part that's most important is timing. 
And if we think about speech recognition, right now, as I talk, my, my amplitude is changing, my frequency and pitch is changing as I'm saying different words, but the overall cue that you might be getting that's also changing over time is the temporal cues that are conveyed by the rate and the pattern of stimulation. So as what I'm saying changes over time, the amplitude's changing, the frequency's changing, the timing is changing, all three of these work together to convey important speech recognition cues. And we have control over these factors when we're programming the patient's processors. So we're going to be reviewing that in the next few slides. When we first sit down with a patient, one of the first things we need to do is define the stimulation parameters. So one of the important stimulation parameters is the sound processing strategy. Each device has more than one sound processing strategy available for use with an implant patient. And that's great because not everybody hears the best with the same processing strategy. So if I start with a processing strategy and the patient's not doing well, I'm gonna to wanna to try a different strategy to see if I can make them hear better with that. So what does this processing strategy do? It's amazing. I sit across some patients every day and think, wow, how, how do you understand everything that's happening? Well, it's this amazing sound processing strategy that makes this possible. It takes the incoming signal, it converts it to an electric signal for delivery to the inner ear. The sound processing strategies vary from manufacturer to manufacturer and then within the manufacturer, but the clinician has to make a choice at the beginning as to which sound processing strategy they're going to use with which patient. We're going to talk about the lower and upper levels of stimulation, the T and the C or the M level. A T stands for threshold, that would be a very soft sound. The upper level would be the C or M and those would be louder sounds. We're going to determine how fast we want to stimulate these electrodes, so um, what will the rate of stimulation be? We might want to change their pulse width or frequency allocation bands. There are so many choices that the clinician has to be familiar with right before they start because we set these before we even start to program. And it's important for clinicians to understand what the effects of each of these are on the patient's perception with the cochlear implant. So in order to review these, um, these aspects that we just talked about, I'd like to go take you through the mapping screens and we're going to begin with the mapping screen that the implant audiologist might see with an advanced bionics device. So here we see the mapping screen and the first thing I want to orient you to are the electrode numbers. So you can see that they're numbered from 1 to 16. There are 16 electrodes in the advanced bionics device. The number one electrode corresponds to a low frequency, so that would fall in the apical end of the cochlea or further in, the furthest in on the electrode array, whereas the higher numbers refer to the higher pitch and these would be in the basal end of the cochlea. So all of the software will have the electrodes numbered and in this particular device it travels from sort of a low pitch percept to a high pitch percept. The next thing we see on this screen is the upper level of stimulation. So here we have all 16 of the electrodes. We have an upper level of stimulation and we have a lower level of stimulation. What we will do with an advanced bionics device is ask the patient will stimulate one electrode at a time or we can stimulate four electrodes at a time, but we'll ask the patient to tell us when the sound is most comfortable, the loudness that they would like to have speech at. And we can do that for all of the 16 electrodes and this is a pretty typical looking map. Uh, we want to look at how high or how low those levels are, uh, but this is the upper level of stimulation. The next thing we can look at is the lower level of stimulation or the threshold. In the advanced bionics device, the default is to leave the threshold at a preset level, which is typically about 10% of what the upper level is. You can set these to where the patient first hears sound, which some clinicians do, but these are the thresholds and these are the M levels. Next thing I wanted to point out on this screen are the um, parameters that the clinician can change about what the patient is hearing. Uh, 
So here we have the strategy that they can pick. There are noise suppression things, pulse width. There are um, some aspects of the signal we could put on wind block or sound relax. There's different aspects that the clinician can let the patient listen to while it's live so they can see if the patient likes those features, we can discuss them. Typically for children who don't provide us with such feedback, um, we have sort of preset parameters that we're going to use on the young children. And as they age and provide more feedback, then we might try uh, different features with their programming. This is an example of a mapping screen for the MedL device. Um, I, I like showing these screens because you can see clinicians who work with all three different devices have very different software. Um, the first thing I want to point out with the MedL is again they're numbered one to 10. Actually, theirs goes 1 to 12. This shows that we've turned off a couple of the electrodes uh, for some reason. They might be outside of the, the cochlea. This is in the basal end. Or the patient might have a short or open circuit. Or they might just not like the sound quality of that device. But a clinician judgment might be to turn off the electrode. But similar to the AB device, the lower numbers represent the lower pitch and the higher numbers represent the higher pitch. Here we've got the thresholds, similar to AB. They do not recommend that you always assess, assess thresholds, but you certainly can. Um, and we can do that and compare how the patient hears if we've entered true thresholds or if we've gone through the for the defaults. So again, you'll see about a 10% automatic setting of the thresholds in this example. Over here, we have some of the parameters, again, that can be set by the clinician. They're a little bit different than what we saw with the advanced bionics device. And so the different manufacturers place the parameters in, in different places in the software. And they also include different parameters that they allow the clinician to manipulate or change. Next here, we have a mapping screen uh, example for a cochlear device. They're the opposite of advanced bionics in terms of their numbering. So their numbering goes from high to low, while their pitch perception goes from low to high. So it makes it somewhat confusing if you're operating with all three devices. But the good thing um, is that for all three screens, the low pitches are on the left-hand side. So we know if we're working with these electrodes, they're low pitched. And as we move to the right, they're more high pitched. In the nucleus device, there are 22 active electrodes that we can deal with. And all of the mapping information uh, that we're working with, we get a graphical representation here, but we also have numerical representation here. The things I'd like to point out here are again um, that apical to basal direction of the, the numbering. So the 22 is the furthest in, and these are closest to the outside of the cochlea. We can see the C level and the T level here, so they're graphically represented. This is a big difference between cochlear and MedL and AB. Cochlear, actually, their speech processing strategy requires the clinician to set thresholds. So that's why they're not set to a default level of the sea level, but they're actually quite a bit higher because the clinician determines the softest level of sound that the patient hears and sets the threshold to that level. I'm going to go back and just show you here on the nucleus device on both the left and the right hand side, we have parameters that are set by the clinician. You can set how many beeps you'd like to present, if we'd like to sweep. There's all different, different choices that we have while we're in the programming screen. And then some more choices are located here at the bottom. A lot of our patients uh, are now receiving bilateral implants. It's actually become the standard of care for cochlear implants. And it makes it a lot more efficient if we're able to program both the right and the left processor at the same time. 
So I wanted to mention that, that many clinicians uh, will bring up the bilateral programming screens. The one on the left here is for a nucleus device, and the one on the right here shows the bilateral programming screens for advanced bionics. So we can actually make it go live in both the right and the left. And if they say, you know, it seems a lot softer on my left ear, then I can actually increase the levels while we're live and help them balance it out. Sometimes clinicians will do one ear and then do the other and then work on balancing at the end, but a lot of clinicians will uh, bilaterally balance them simultaneously while they're both programmed uh, in the software. All right, so we mentioned just a little bit about the thresholds. Um, the measurement of thresholds is dependent on the sound processing strategy. So some of them will sort of behind the scenes uh, determine what they think a, a threshold would be. But for devices where you're required to set the threshold, it's really important to get them accurate and correct. If a threshold is set too low, then the patient won't be hearing softer sounds that will be inaudible. The mapping will be stimulating at a level that the patient can't hear, and it's sort of a waste of energy if it's stimulating and they can't hear it. If the thresholds are set too high, the patient might perceive, perceive some noise in the environment, and instead of being soft, it might be medium, and that really throws off their, their loudness scaling or they might hear circuit noises of the processor. So setting the T's appropriately is, is really an important part of the appointment. If a child wears a hearing aid on their contralateral ear, or the adult, we'll always ask them to remove it because if there's any sounds in the environment that would get in the way of setting the T's, we don't want that to happen. Now, as we move more and more towards patients having more hearing in the other ear, we have to be aware of that. And if they have some usable residual hearing that even if they take off the hearing aid and they can hear the sound, or in cases of single-sided deafness where we're implanting the deaf ear, they've got a normal ear in the other ear, we might want to plug that ear to reduce the effects that the background noises might have on their setting of threshold levels. With children, we can't just tell them, raise your hand when you hear a very soft sound because we lose them very quickly. So instead, we're going to use visual response, uh, re visual reinforcement audiometry or condition play audiometry. And we're going to be looking for 100% detection of the threshold when we're programming thresholds for a nucleus device. As we mentioned previously, thresholds are not typically measured with advanced bionics in MedL, but several recent clinical recommendations include trying thresholds if a patient's not making adequate progress. I know I've tried this with a, a lot of my patients that utilize MedL and advanced bionics. Um, some of them don't notice a difference, but some of them, it's taken them from not being happy with their program to making a big difference. So for those implant clinicians out there, I, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to try setting the T's if problems arise with a patient's current program. In young children, for very young children, um, setting a threshold is similar to obtaining a threshold in the sound field or uh, under insert earphones. So for the very young children, we're going to do behavioral observation audiometry. We're going to present some sound. We're going to watch to see if their breathing patterns change, if they shift their eye movements, maybe raise their eyebrow, um, maybe if they've got a pacifier in and they're sucking in a sort of a, a different way once we ad administer the sound, uh, if they start to smile, if they start to cry, um, those are the kinds of things we're going to watch for in the very young children. As they get older, we're going to look for a conditioned response with VRA. A lot of clinics have portable computer screens that they can use for VRA so the child can learn to look towards the VRA toy and get a positive reinforcement uh, that they've looked there in response to sound. And the optimal is condition play. So we have to make it fun. We have to make it interactive to keep their attention, but we'll teach them to drop a ball or place a peg in a bucket or on a, um, on a chart, might put a sticker down, um, but something that tells us that they've actually heard that sound. 
I think one of the things clinicians look at is they say, holy moly, there's 22 electrodes. How am I going to do all of those thresholds or how am I going to set all of those C-levels? Won't that take forever? Well, one of the nice things is with programming screens, we have the ability to interpolate. So, for example, if we were uh, programming a patient's processor and it was a one-year-old and we had a short attention span, I might start with electrode 18 and then I might go to six and then I might go to 22 and get their threshold and I might go to one and they might be done. They might start to cry and we lose their intention, a attention. The good thing is that's okay because we can take the ones that we have measured, we hit a magic button on the side that will then fill in the blanks for us with the programming screen. This isn't available with all devices. We can't do it with some of the older devices, but all three of the manufacturers provide us with this ability to interpolate. And that's because typically with most patients, the adjacent electrodes are very similar in both their T and their C measurements. With adults, um, again, thresholds are not always performed with advanced bionics and med -L, but with the adults, the instructions are so important. If I tell them to indicate when they first hear it, uh, and I need to make sure they understand it because I really want it to be very soft when they first hear it. If their thought process is, well, I want to be certain I hear it and I'm setting it more to medium, we're going to have those thresholds that are set too loud. A lot of our patients have head noise or tinnitus that might make setting the thresholds quite difficult. Some patients really don't like to set the thresholds. Um, what I instruct the adults to do is I say I'm going to play beep, 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 beep. I'm just going to gradually make those beeps louder. And what I'm looking for is the first point where you're certain that you hear two beeps. If you're not sure, don't say anything because the next time it'll be a little bit louder and you might say, oh, there it is. And that's the point that I'm looking for. Some clinicians uh, might ask a patient to count the T's. So they might present two beeps or three beeps or one beep or four beep. And they'll, again, typically look for 100% accuracy and that's where they'll mark the threshold. But again, it's very important to be certain that the thresholds are accurate because they have a, a very imp uh, a large impact on patient performance. So once we've done those thresholds, then our next thing to do, if, if we need to do those thresholds, our next thing to do is measure the upper levels or the C or M levels. Cochlear calls the upper level the C level, and it really stands for loud but comfortable. With an adult, I'm going to tell them, okay, we're done with your soft sounds. Now we're going to increase each electrode by electrode. I'm going to take you up as loud as I possibly can where it is still comfortable. In order to figure that out, one of the most effective ways to do that with an adult is to take it up to where it's just a little bit too loud and then back it down. With the M levels for A, B, and Med L, I'm going to instruct them differently. I'm going to tell them that we're going to be setting the upper level to the level of current that's most comfortable, the level that you would like speech to be at. And the reason for these differences in the instructions is because the cochlear device will not stimulate above the C level. So when I set a C level with a nucleus device, as you can see down here, the speech processing strategy that works with that device will never stimulate above that level. So if I set it just below uncomfortable, I know it's tolerable, it might be loud, but that gives me a better range between soft and loud for the device to work with. With AB, we're going to say ask them, as well as with Medel. Medel might be a little bit louder, but in general, we're going to be asking them to set it where it's most comfortable because with both of these devices, they're programmed to stimulate above the upper level. So they will be hearing some sounds that are louder than that upper level. With children, we'll adjust the M levels based on the child's reaction to sound. So typically, we'll see how they're reacting with an M level. We go live when we turn all of them on together. If they're pulling the device off and crying, we say, oop, those are a little too loud and we'll bring them down. Um, and so it's important for us to be able to read our patient when we're setting these C and M levels. 
in young children, how do we do this? It's funny, I have a lot of adults that come in and say, how do you set these things for children? Well, what we'll do at the activation is we'll find their threshold and then we'll raise the C level, the level above that in very small units and we'll first shoot for a dynamic range of 25. So we'll bring it about 25 units above. We'll go live or we'll sweep at those levels and make sure there aren't any negative reactions. If there's any ne negative reactions, we're going to bring them down and they'll have a, a smaller range than 25. Next appointment, they come in and we might increase it to 30 or 35 and see how they do with that. And then we might increase it up to a dynamic range of 50 units above threshold. So at each of these subsequent appointments, we're refining where they first hear it and we're gradually increasing that upper level until we get a reasonable dynamic range. All of the time when we're doing this, we're watching for negative behavior that might indicate that a sound is too loud. And in older children, we'll start to use a loudness scaling. We'll say, okay, tell me if this sound is soft, medium, loud, if it's too loud. And we wanna set them to either medium or loud for the child, depending upon the mapping strategy. One thing that's often used with children is if you set all of their thresholds, you can set their sea level just above that and then gradually bring them all up together, uh, increasing them about five units at a time, 10 units at a time. And as you do that, you're talking to the child and watching their behavior. So early on, that's oftentimes a way that a initial program might, might be set is with streamlining, where you basically are taking all the sea levels up by the same amount at the same time. With adults, it's important that all of their upper levels be equal in loudness. So we might do loudness balancing with either one or two electrodes. So they might hear beep, beep, and then they'll tell me the second one was louder. I'll turn it down until they tell me they're both the same loudness. If I do three, they'll hear beep, 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 and they'll tell me, oh, those sound good, they're all the same loudness, or they might say, ah, number one is quite a bit softer. Then I would increase the level of number one, sweep them again and tell me that, until they tell me that they're all the same loudness. And really this is important because our goal is for all of those upper levels, the C or the M levels, to be the same loudness for the patient. So once we've set those levels, the T's, and the C, we're ready to activate their device and they're going to hear speech. And on the activation, when they first hear speech, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty tense moment for families. They're all anxious and excited, but it's important to remind families that live speech is very different than programming because once we go live, they're listening with the entire array, whereas when we're programming, they're typically listening to one electrode at a time or maybe a couple of, of electrodes at a time. But we want to prepare the family that the child might like it, they might hate it, they might cry, they might laugh, they might have zero reaction at all. We want to make sure we activate them in a quiet environment. We want to first turn the volume and the sensitivity way down because the last thing we want to do is make their first experience with speech to be a bad one that's too loud or negative. Then we're going to slowly increase the volume and sensitivity. If we don't see any reaction, then we can globally increase those upper levels, globally bringing all of them up, either the C's or the M levels, until we start to see a reaction to sound from the child or from the adult. In the activation, our goal for the first two weeks, especially for children, is to keep it on, turned on, and we can check their data logging to make sure that's happening. And we want to remind the families that the sound is different than hearing aids. If we provide them with a map that's too loud at the activation, they're probably going to refuse to wear the device and they're going to run for the hills as soon as the parent brings them back to our office. We're going to want to counsel the family regarding care and use of the device. Adults on activation often describe speech as having an echo, which typically subsides. They might say, wow, it sounds like I'm in a tin can. It sounds very mechanical or high pitched. But we just counsel them that, believe me, it's going to sound better in 10 minutes. It's going to sound even better in a day. And when you come back in a week, it's going to sound better by then. Uh, if I activate an adult, I'll probably spend five or 10 minutes talking to them and then I'll cover my face and I'll say, 
tell me what number I say, I'll give you a number between one and 100. Adults typically on day one find that to be a very easy task. Then I'll go to colors and then I might do simple questions. What's your favorite color? What size shoe do you wear? I would say 90% of our post-lingually deaf and patients can get through all three of those. And if I can see good speech recognition, doesn't really bother me what they're saying about the sound quality because I know that that will get better over time. And really what we want is that speech recognition. One of the hardest things for clinicians, especially new clinicians, to determine with a programming appointment is what are typical levels. Just like anything else, we sort of have a mindset of what is normal and what falls outside that normal. So I've listed here a, a resource for you. This is a, a manuscript that we published a few years back where we examined the mapping characteristics of 188 children who were enrolled in the Childhood Development After Cochlear Implantation Study. And the reason I cite this is because the data uh, was collected at six different implant programs that were part of the CDACI study. And Prior to this, um, it was really hard to find typical level information for children with both normal and abnormal cochleas in the literature. So a new person coming into the field might say, I, I don't know, their level's at 200. Is that high? Is that low? Is that pretty typical? So in this manuscript, uh, we provide mean uh, C and M levels. We had to convert it to nanocoulombs, so we had to convert it to levels of charge. But then, in order to make it sensible for clinicians, we converted it back to their clinical units. And all of the cl clinical units are, are not identical. So you might see here an example where the average level is 206 for advanced bionics, 201 for nucleus, and 750 for medel. That doesn't mean that it's that much higher in medel. Uh, it just is a different cl clinical measurement. But if you're working with a medel patient, you think, boy, these look really high. You can go to something like this uh, and, and look it up to see if your patient's measurements are falling similar to at least the children in the CDACI study. And in this, we had two different tables, one for children with normal cochlea, and then we had measurement levels or average levels for children with abnormal cochlea. We provide average levels obtained at activation six 12 and 24 months. And the reason for that is we do see changes over time in the threshold levels as well as in the upper levels of stimulation. So it's good for clinicians to be aware of those. One thing I wanted to point out is a figure from there where we do see it's, it's highly anticipated that children with normal cochlea are going to have lower average stimulation levels than children with abnormal cochlea, which we see here in this upper bar. So what we see is that at about six months post-activation, things start to plateau. There's not really a big change between 6, 12, and 24, but there is quite a quite a climb between activation and the sixth month. We also see this big difference between children with normal and abnormal cochlea. So if I have a child whose preoperative CT or MRI indicated that they have an abnormal cochlea, I'm going to go into my programming appointment expecting their levels are going to be higher. I don't know how much higher. That really depends on the anomaly. But at least I know they're going to be higher than average when I have someone with an abnormal cochlea. So this is all well and good when we've got children that behave. Um, but what if it's difficult to obtain reliable psychophysical responses? We know a lot of children aren't going to drop a block and they're not even going to give us uh, BOA responses when we're programming. So there are objective measures that are available to assist the clinician with setting of those T and those C levels or those T and their M levels. The two most commonly used objective measures include electrically evoked compound action potentials or ECAPs. The uh, manufacturers each have their, their own procedure for evaluating ECAPs, and they also have their own um, trademark name for those. Uh, NRT is what Cochlear uses. NRI is the terminology used by Advanced Bionics, and ART, or ART, uh, is used by Medel to refer to their ECAP measurement systems. 
The other one we're going to review briefly are the electrical stapedial reflex thresholds. So let's talk about ECAPs first. So here you can see in this figure a picture of an electrode array and its, um, its closeness and proximity to the nerves and the spiral ganglion cells that we want to stimulate uh, with our electrical stimulation. So what an ECAP does is there are a brief set of current pulses that are delivered to an electrode the stimulus pulses excite the auditory nerve fibers located close to that stimulating electrode and cause them to generate a neural response. So if I stimulate this electrode here, these spiral ganglion cells or neurons are going to respond and generate um, neural responses that we refer to as the ECAP. The electrode near the stimulated electrode, so this one here, would pick up that neural response, amplify it, digitize it, and then transmit the information about the response across the skin to the externally worn coil and then send it back to the programming software. ECAPs, as we said, are available with all three commercially available devices, but on this next slide, I have an example of, of something that we might see. So um, I like this slide because it, it shows different levels. We're ranging from a, a low level of 196, and we go up in level. And as we go up in level, we're seeing a change in the ECAP response. So what we see here is, oh, it's starting to show. I can see it getting a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And as we go up in current level, the response is definitely there and getting more prevalent. So I could maybe consider that right here might be my ECAP threshold and that I that's probably where I would mark it. When do we need to use ECAPs? Well, a lot of times they're very helpful in programming very young children, long-term deaf and adults that aren't really good at telling us if a sound is soft, medium, or loud. We know that if we see a, a threshold for example, in this example, the NRT, we'll know that that sound is audible. It's going to fall somewhere between their T and C level. We don't know exactly where, but we know it's going to be somewhere in there. In our clinic, we always use these in combination with behavioral responses. It, it would be nice if we could just simply program off of ECAPS, but that's not possible. Uh, we don't have a way to do that yet. So it really requires the clinician to be um, on top of things and, and be able to be a good pediatric audiologist and, and read uh, the responses of the children or of the adults. It does give us some information about auditory nerve function and it can be quickly measurized. Uh, the software makes it very easy for us to run some uh, evoke potentials. For example, in the Nucleus device, these are where we got the uh, ECAP thresholds for this electrode, and here's one for this electrode and this electrode. And you can see our behavioral responses pretty much follow uh, the lines of the ECAP measure. So it gives us sort of a double check on our mapping to make sure that it's, it's in agreement with our uh, objective measures. The next most commonly used one is the electric stapedial reflex thresholds, or ESRTs. Uh, Michelle Hughes, pro Hughes provided me with permission to, to use this. It's from her uh, book on electrophysiologic measures with cochlear implants. It's a, a fabulous book. Um, and really, the ESRTs, they require programming software that will stimulate an electrode. And then we're going to utilize an impedance bridge to look for the acoustic reflex. So we know that our ear, when it receives a loud sound, we have um, an, an acoustic reflex that will cause contraction of our tympanic membrane, and it's in response to this loud sound. And the very cool thing is that when we stimulate a loud sound via the cochlear implant, that that acoustic reflex will be present. So basically, what we're doing is we're using programming software here and we're using the impedance bridge over here, we're gonna deliver a loud sound to the implant and we're going to measure either in the contralateral ear or the ipsilateral ear because the acoustic reflex is a bilateral phenomenon. If I stimulate this ear, it should be present over here and here. So I can measure in either ear, but I'm gonna stimulate in my implant 
a loud sound and I'm going to see if the acoustic reflex happens. I'm going to find where it goes away and where it first happens. And the beauty of that is it will help me set my upper levels of stimulation. So if I can look for what level of stimulation results in the acoustic reflex on several of the electrodes, I can sort of shape my upper levels, either my C or my uh, my M levels. And there's very good correlation between the upper levels and the acoustic reflex that you can obtain with the ESRT. So once we've adequately set the thresholds and the comfort levels, we need to take all of this information and transfer it to the sound processor. I've just put up examples of what that might look like. It, it varies again with the three different manufacturers. We have Advanced Bionics here. There's a small screen on the far right hand side where it will let us number, decide which programs go in which slot and some of the features we want to add on at that point. This is the downloading screen for the Medel. This one, uh, I decided just to load two programs to this processor. And then this one here is uh, an older Nucleus screen. And uh, we have four programs that we've downloaded to their processor. So when we download, boy, are there a lot of choices that the clinician needs to make. We're able to choose from a variety of options, um, such as noise reduction features. Uh, do we want to add noise reduction into all programs? Do we only want to put it onto one program? We can tell the processor what to do in terms of microphone directionality. We can look at some of the bilateral features we might want to utilize. So um, a very cool feature of advanced bionics devices is I can program a processor that will work on either the right or the left ear. And actually that processor contains the programs, all the programs for both ears. But when I put it on the right ear, it goes, oh, it's on the right ear and it will only access the right ear programs and the same will happen if you put it on the left. You tell the soft via the software if you want to make it be a bilaterally compatible processor. If I want to um, make it compatible with certain accessories, if I want to turn on lights so the family can know if the battery is still working, if I want to turn those lights off, there are just so many options for these processors. When we download, we don't ever want to forget about the other ear. Um, we showed you previously that all three manufacturers have the ability to program bilaterally. But before downloading, we want to check to make sure that the sound the patient is receiving with the sound processor is compatible or equally loud with the sound they're getting in the opposite ear cochlear implant and that it's working well with a hearing aid in the contralateral ear. We can't always loudness balance with a cochlear implant and a hearing aid because sometimes if um, they're profoundly deaf in the other ear and they're still wearing a hearing aid, we can't get good sound in that ear. Uh, but we want to make sure that they're balanced and the patient is comfortable with it. Um, I have an example here of a, a NOAA link because some devices enable you to link the implant sound processor with a certain brand of hearing aid. So Phonak um, has partnered or uh, in conjunction with Advanced Bionics. Uh, so those devices are able to communicate with one another. So you might have a Phonak hearing aid and an AIDA implant sound processor that can communicate with one another and Resound and Cochlear do a similar thing where both devices, if you link them in the software before downloading, that they can both stream from an iPhone or an Android and um, they need to be linked in order for that to happen. So if you see a patient that says they're not working compatibly, um, they might need to be linked in the implant clinician's uh, software. If we look at programming after activation, um, we can't just activate it and send them on their way. Um, frequent programming sessions are important for the first year of device use as well as subsequent years in order to monitor changes in hearing and to continue to evaluate performance. These patients have a surgically implanted device and it's really up to the implant audiologist to be monitoring the integrity of that internal device over time. What we'll see in programming after, after activation is that the threshold levels or the softest level of sound will typically decrease as their experience with listening increases. 
The C or M levels will typically increase as the implant user learns to tolerate more loudness. So if those T levels go down a little bit over the first appointments and the C levels go up, it gives us more of a dynamic range, which is the distance between the T and the upper level. And that gives us more options for cueing loudness uh, to the implant patient. We like a nice wide dynamic range. Um, it doesn't necessarily correlate with better performance. We don't see that people with larger dynamic ranges hear better, but we wanna make sure that we have enough of a range to adequately convey information about loudness. After activation, at activation, we may give them four programs. Program one's typically the softest, and we might say, you're not coming back for a week. After two days, I want you to change your child's program to number two. After two more days, I want you to move up to number three, and then I want you to move to number four. If the child seems uncomfortable, if it seems too loud, I want you to move back down to the one where they were comfortable, but we work with the families to find out how much change in loudness they can tolerate over that first week or over that first month. In the beginning, we want to provide them with successively louder programs, but they become less necessary with time because as we've increased that dynamic range, we don't want to increase keep increasing it. If we kept increasing it over time, we, we would run out of room and our patients would eventually be up at a, a level that um, is not good, that would cause distortion. So early on, we're optimizing that range and we're going to give them those louder programs, but typically by, I would say, one to three months, they're going to plateau and stay there. Same is true of adults. Adults at the three month will say, ah, I never got to program four. I'm on number three and I'm good. And that's a signal to me that I don't need to give them progressively louder programs. It's very important not to push patients to louder programs because louder is not always better. Again, you can run into issues with distortion, voltage compliance, other issues that make your programming difficult, but we really should shoot for getting them into a, an area that sounds good. Once they're in that area, uh, they typically stay there and we just need to make small adjustments around those levels. So what is a, a programming schedule typically look like in the, the first year of device use? In our clinic, we see them at activation, which is um, one appointment on one day. We used to see them two days in a row, but we found that that second day appointment was really too early. So we see them about two weeks after surgery to activate their device. We then see them one week later. We then see them at one, two, four, six, nine, and 12 months post-activation. If they're, it's their second year, they're a bilateral user, we might not need all of these appointments. It's really up to the clinician judgment to determine if they need more than these or if they need less than these. And you'll see that uh, this schedule of appointments will really vary from clinic to clinic. At the annual evaluation, so once they've reached that 12 month mark, we'll start to see them every six to 12 months. And at those appointments, we'll do regular programming. We just check the programming and then we do speech recognition testing. For children less than four years of age, we typically use a, a test assistant for both programming and testing, meaning that we have someone that sits with the child, keeps the games moving, changes them quickly, so the clinician can really focus on what she's doing at the computer to make the changes so that we can really be effective in that appointment for that patient. Our programming schedule for adults, they're seen less often because they can take themselves through those louder programs um, as they adjust to sound. So we typically see them at activation one week, one month, and three, six, and 12 months later. So we only see them six times that first year. They're doing well. We release them for annual appointments, um, but we always tell them if you're not hearing well in six months, don't wait a year to come back. You might not be able to go a full 12 months. If you need to see us, please come back sooner so we can continue to optimize your device. So part of programming, a very important part of programming is evaluating performance with the device. We're going to put the patient in the sound field and we're gonna evaluate their sound field detection. 
We're going to evaluate their speech perception. So are they making progress? Are they able to understand with this electrical signal we've programmed their device for? And we're also going to um, utilize the expertise of our speech language pathologist to tell us if it's really working, which means um, if they're developing good spoken language skills. And really, this is how we validate that what we're doing has been correct. With sound field testing, we want the children to obtain sound field thresholds that might fall anywhere from about 15 to 30 decibels. Um, and they really should be fall between about 20 and 25 for children in order for them to have access to these softer aspects of speech that we see here. Children will um, have biannual evaluations followed by annual evaluations when ready because if something's not right, we don't want to wait a whole year. We want to catch them when that happens. Whereas adults, they can tell us they'll schedule themselves sooner if for some reason they're not doing well. So as we wind down, I think one of the really important things is how can a speech language pathologist help the implant audiologist? Well, in our program, the SLPs play such a major role in the dev child's device use and progress. One thing that our SLPs do is we've given them access to the programming software. They start each of their therapy sessions by plugging in the child's processor and reading their data logging. They see them every week. And as you saw, we might only see them, you know, a couple of months in between or a month in between. And they can counsel the family about data logging and the device use. Our motto, which is the same motto in many clinics, is eyes open, ears on. So their device should be on all the time that they're awake. The SLP lets us know if they have concerns about the child's performance, uh, if they're not hearing certain sounds or not making adequate progress. Typically, children should demonstrate awareness of all the link sounds, so the SLP will check for that uh, prior to each therapy appointment. And they really should be making adequate progress in their speech and language skills. And if they're not, please let the audiologist know. You can put your heads together and try to figure out why not, because it might be their mapping. And really, the only way we're going to know that it's not working until we put them in the booth and test them ourselves is if um, the people that are working with the children more often are the ones to let us know. You might want to ask your implant audiologist about the best way to communicate. Maybe it's email, maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's in person, but it's really important to, to communicate. A big question we get from speech pathologists or audiologists that work with our children in the schools is, what do I do if a child's not doing well? Well, Again, the first thing to do is communicate with the implant audiologist. But if, let's say, you're a speech pathologist in the schools and the child's not making adequate progress, you've communicated to the clinic about your concerns, I actually think it's very appropriate for professionals to recommend that a family go for a second opinion. Not every audiologist who programs an implant does a perfect job. So it might be that one audiologist lands on something that works better for that child than a different audiologist. It might be that if a child's not making adequate progress, I'll go ask someone in my program, hey, can we powwow about this and figure out what's going on? Um, or they might need to go outside our clinic to get a, a second opinion so that everyone feels better. I'll recommend that to families if someone's not making progress, and I'll even give them the name of someone that I know and trust um, that I, I think that they should go to to get a second opinion. So uh, if you're a professional working with those children, uh, please don't uh, be, be worried about recommending second opinions or recommending that the parent talk with the clinician about their concerns or that you talk to the clinician about your concerns. So in general, um, the routine programming continues to be important after activation. Changes in hearing might occur and they might lead to decreased performance over time. And the only way we can know that is if we measure the thresholds in the upper levels and if we evaluate performance. Frequent small changes in sound, if somebody comes in every year 
and we tweak their device. They're just little changes and they, they tolerate them well. If they haven't come in for five years and there's five years of changes and we change it, they're gonna, they're gonna not like those changes and it's gonna be harder for them to adjust to. It's really important for patients to come back because we can tell them about changes in technology. We might have an upgrade in our software that's gonna give them access to some really nice technological changes. It helps us monitor both the internal and external function of the device. So if their device is failing, doesn't happen very often, but we can be on top of that and manage it as quickly as possible. So in conclusion, um, I really can't underestimate how important accurate programming is. It's an essential component of successful CI use. Unfortunately, bad mapping does happen. And in a child especially, we've had some transfer patients come who've been poorly mapped for two years. If the child got the implant at one and we get them at three, they've missed two years of good listening. And, and that does happen. So it's important for all of us to be on top of the child's mapping to make certain that it's optimized. Their various tools are available to assist clinician when patients are difficult to test. So um, we can bring in another clinician. We can use those objective measures that we talked about. So even an autistic child can get a good cochlear implant map on them. The ones that we struggle with most are the children with severe cochlear abnormalities. Those are the children that we just might not be able to get a really good map on, but we wanna do everything we can to make sure that their map is optimized. Often a combination of both subjective and objective measures result in, in an optimized program, and optimized programs can lead to great success with a cochlear implant. All of those great things that we've heard about with open set speech recognition and the fact that many of these children are meeting normal gains in, term of, uh, in terms of speech and language, educational placement, and then uh, getting great jobs when, when they're out of school and uh, having great hearing for a lifetime. So I know this was a lot of information. I so appreciate your attention and I hope um, this has provided you with a, a greater understanding and sort of a sneak peek under the hood of what's involved in speech processor programming appointments. So thank you for your time.